welcome to our live session. We're really glad to be here. This is one of my favorite moments in, in, uh, in my work life. Holly is when I get to do time with you. And, and by do time, I mean, I mean, like not the prison type of do time. I mean, like spend, spend quality time um, bantering with one of the best. And, and Holly, what I've always said about you is um, you have EQ that's out of this world. I think your emotional intelligence is, is unlike any other. Um, I saw you speak for the first time in 2017, I think, in Western New York, and then we became fast friends, and um, and the rest is history. Here we are on our second or third. Is it? I think this is actually our third session. So it's at least our second, honey. But I'm so glad to be with you. Thanks for inviting me. And I, my friends, I thought Scott was in upstate New York still, but guess what? Mm -mm. He's across the country in warm weather. You snake. <laughs> You know what? Snow up here in New England. <laughs> oh, are you guys? Are you? Are you? Uh, are you welcoming the powdery white stuff? Um, the cold powdery white stuff, I guess. Um, well, my, my attitude is to choose hope over fear. So when I see something like that coming, I choose to see it as beautiful until I need to go outside. <laughs> Yeah. But no, it's gorgeous. I mean, we're still we're not in the mud season yet. We got a lot of beauty to go through. I just in fact, you won't you will probably believe this, my friends. For the first time in my almost 75 years, I put up ready for this my holiday tree yesterday. It's up with the white light shining and it's just so cheerful. I've never done that before. This you never well, sweetie, I've never done it be this early. I always would get a real tree and I would get it, oh, probably early December. Um, but now I just said, you know what? I'm so home, so much home. I'm not flying all over the world. And so I am delighted at night when it gets dark early, the lights come up and I can just look at the miracle of this tree with the white lights on it. And it's, I had a friend over yesterday, we were safely distanced and we sat there looking at the tree together. <laughs> it was so reassuring. I think Scott, the truth is this horrible pandemic and all of the anxiety of the election and the anxiety of the other pandemics going on, the racism, all of that is scary, but it all also reminds me of what really matters. And I would just invite our listeners right now to, to take a moment. And Scott, I'm going to ask you this too. And then we'll go back to the traditional back and forth. <laughs> but I just want to ask, what is it that gives you a sense of joy in this darkest of times? And if not joy, if that's too exuberant, what gives you a sense of peacefulness and um, hope in this time of such ongoing pandemic? Yeah, I realized yesterday uh, I spent the whole day with my wife and, and um, I get so excited for weekends. And, and here I am a, an admitted workaholic, somebody that loves work. Um, I've always been one of those that's tried to create a work culture of if, if you are coming to work with uh, ho-hum, oh, bummer, it's Monday. And uh, oh, yes, it's Friday and something's wrong. And and that, that for me has been turned on its head because of the value that I have for the time I get to spend with my wife and the time that, you know, every other Saturday, um, because uh, my, my, my wife's parents are, are in their 60s and they, they, you know, they're being very diligent. Um, we do their shopping for them and uh, they thank us so profusely and on the way out every Saturday, every other Saturday, because we do it every other week, I'm thinking to myself, this this was nothing. Like the gratitude you're expressing, this is this is my joy right now. I, I just um, so those times with family, um, I, like you said, Holly, I think they bring so much. They're they're shrouded with and marinated in so much more perspective. Um, I love, I just love that time. Um, what about you? What, what are the things that you've, that the, the gratitude bells have really gone off um, regarding here in the last six fun months? Oh, I have, um, 
you know, as a trauma survivor, I'll just level with people because that will, will be our topic today. How do we help children and staff through the immediacy of trauma? Because there's a lot of immediate pressure right now on us that brings trauma. Um, and also, I want to say, though, Scott, and this is true for everyone who's a trauma survivor listening, which we know, by the way, that the unpublished research tells us that 58% of us in early childhood are trauma survivors from, from our own childhoods. So that's the majority of us. And that was a conservative study done by a colleague named Jackie Taylor in Texas. And she said, Holly, at least I made this study conservative because I did not want anyone to question the authenticity of it, but it's much higher. And anecdotally, anecdotally, as I've gone around the country and in fact the world and asked this question, it's more like 80% or and above of those of us who chose early childhood have experienced ourselves traumatizing times. So I'm gonna, that was a long convoluted but hopefully helpful way of saying, in answer to your question, Scott, as a trauma survivor, I know deeply what fear is and I know what terror is and I know what deep sadness is and I know what it's like to feel abandoned by the people who were intended to care for you. And I have a choice every day, Scott, and that is I, I could be resentful. But, you know, Buddha said this, um, almost everybody said it in one form or another, holding on to a resentment only hurts me, doesn't hurt anybody else. So what I've decided to do is to find joy and find hope in every moment. And so there have been times, uh, I'll tell you the truth again, during this election, and I'm not going to talk politics. I'm just going to talk about the underlying feelings. Our democracy is going through a change, which whomever you voted for, you had a strong investment. And I'm a recovering attorney, and I, I studied the Constitution. I studied the Bill of Rights, and, I, and it matters to me in many, many, many heartfelt ways. And so I was anxious. I was very anxious, and anxiety for a trauma survivor can trigger post-traumatic memories coming back. So what I did, what I did so many times, and this is available to everybody, I reached out for help as often as I needed it. I would get on my trusty iPhone and I would text somebody and say, can, can we talk or just text each other? Um, I would, and if there was no one available or if it was at night and I didn't want to bother people, I would go to my spiritual source and just pray or, or meditate. And because I have this wonderful blessing, and I'm going to invite the, our listeners to, say, to, to just tell us if they want in chat or just to, just to think about it, what do you have in your surroundings that restores your hope? What do you have in your surroundings that's beautiful to you? And Scott's already mentioned his wife, which is fabulous to have that deep-hearted connection. For me, I do live alone, and yet I'm a very personal person. So I look out at this magnificent woods, and I look out at the changing of the trees. And here in New England, it has been eloquent. It's as if we've been given an eloquent, resplendent, memorable, one of a type, one of a kind autumn, almost to make up for the tragedy that goes on around us. So every day, Every day through connection with people, Scott, through connection with nature, and through my sense of humor. <laughs> Honey, if I laugh in a heartbeat, things are better. So this is the this is the second session in a row that I've done where at, at the root of all coping mechanisms, at the root of therapeutics, at the root of, of being a better human, humor has, has definitely been kind of the theme. Um, but, but Holly, let me do a quick intro um, and, and then we'll jump right back in. Um, so, so you, as you mentioned before, you're a recovering a attorney uh, and a keynote speaker. Uh, you will be joining us at our bounce conference this July, so fingers crossed. Um, but we are really, really excited about getting together with um, early childhood leaders and and I can't wait to hug people. I can't wait to be, be in the presence of, and the agency of wonderful, beautiful, maternal and paternal people. Um, so, so we're excited about our bounce conference. Um, and 
if you I, I also wanted to mention broken into wholeness it's the the article that you wrote uh in a, a while back right but it's called it's transforming trauma into practical wisdom uh Yes, and Scott, I, I wrote that. I'll just say briefly, I wrote that because Exchange Magazine called me and said, Holly, Elisa, there are children in cages in the United States of America. And I said, I know, I can't, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't handle it. And they said, we want you to write an article that levels with us about this because we're all feeling it but also that gives us a sense that we have agency as you said we have it we there's something we can do i mean i might be in anchorage alaska but so what can i do for those kids well there's a lot so yes that article was written when the children in cages issues first began but it is so relevant today uh, that i recommend it and the other thing that you probably were going to mention is scott when my book on trauma and recovery came out in march of 2020, it sold out immediately. It's called um, Happiness is Running Through the Streets to Find You, translating trauma's harsh legacy into healing. And at first I thought, who's gonna wanna read a book on trauma? But you know, my publisher assured me, look, it's, it's a good book, you're gonna be good. However, it sold out, and why? Because Scott, this is what we're gonna talk about. Everyone, everyone is facing that stressor on our spirit, our soul, and our mind that puts us into a state of hunkering down, hypervigilance, just surviving. And those of us who've chosen early childhood, like you, Scott, I know this about you, those of us that chose early childhood as a profession, as a calling, we chose it because we want, in part, a meaningful life, a life of giving back and a life of making a difference. And so we can't afford to just be survivors. Look what you guys did at kangaroo time. You said, let's give back to the world. And look what you did. You've created all these podcasts weekly so people can tune in and get help. So people can feel connected. Well, that's the second thing about a survivor. It's, it's being able to, 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 to connect. The first thing is to be able to ask for help because many of us were taught not to do that. The second thing is then to be able to receive help because even worse, many of us were taught to be caregivers but not care receivers. So when you talked about your in-laws saying to you, and, and you don't call them your in-laws, you know, your family, they, um, they thank you so profuse, profusely to them. What you're doing is such an act of love. And so every time we receive love, we're giving love. I mean, look how good you feel about yourself because they – are so grateful. That's so you're, amazing. you're receiving. That's right. That's right. Holly, so um, we we talked or we talked a little bit before the call about uh, Nadine Burke Harris's um, ACEs scale, um, the the adverse childhood events scale, and in the the preliminary test, there are eight different of uh, I think there's seven or eight questions and. And of course, I thought, you know, before I took the test an hour ago and it it, it was really sobering because um, I, I think back and I think, you know, um, very, very like uh, middle class, um, very loving family. Um, and, and they're saying, you know, but there was a suicide or an attempted suicide event in, in my family. And, and I never thought of it as as being my adverse childhood event. Uh, and uh, and, and I, I think some of us are just, we cruise through life. Um, we, we, we do deal and cope. Um, we deploy all the coping mechanisms to, to live adult lives. Uh, and you don't even think about or have awareness. So, so as educators, as we speak to early childhood educators, um, where, you know, where is the awareness level, um, as you've seen and worked with uh, educators with adverse childhood events, and, and and how much how much education should should we be focusing on in regard to identifying adverse childhood events? Powerful question, <clears throat> and I think we have no choice. I mean, we always have a choice to go into denial 
you know, like what you just said about you had a, an event in your family that was huge. Someone attempting hu- suicide, that's a life-death thing, and that affects everybody, whether it's talked about or not. Okay, and so now we've got life events that is affecting everybody. And if we can talk about them, all the better. But let me respond to your question. How important is the ACEs study? How important is our awareness? Hugely, hugely. It's almost as if we could flip things upside down and say that this pandemic, the coronavirus is a gift to help us learn. I'll speak for myself. It's been a gift to help me learn what I really what really matters to me. And how do I want to give back to the world? And how can I use my full self, my cranky self, my warts and all self, my boogers in the nose self? (laughs) How can I use all of myself, including my mistakes and my errors and the things that choices I've made that weren't so great? How can I use all of that to give back? And it's important because that ACEs study, when it first came out, um, people thought Oh, well, that's just them. On that, it's other people. And why did we think that? Because many of us, Scott, were in denial. Because yeah. denial, you just talked about it. Denial is a way to sail through life and, and just say, okay, I'm fine. Everything's good. Yeah, I've had a few bumps in the road, but I'm good. And isn't that the way we're taught to be in this country? And it's a it's a it's an uplifting thing. It allows us as leaders to say we can make it through anything, and it is it is connected to resilience. Yes, if we right. feel hope in our bodies, our bodies have a different uh, type of neurodynamic going on. The hope releases endorphins. It's like we just talked beforehand about laughter. If we can laugh, laughter not only connects us to our executive function which is that part of us, as you know, that gives us the ability to be broader thinkers, to be optimistic, to be generous. But laughter releases endorphins. I mean, even if you just took a moment, this this study was done like 40 years ago, and it came out again recently from New Zealand. If you take a pencil and just put it in your mouth like this, (laughs) for one minute, well, look what has to happen, Scott. I got a smile. I got a smile. And even if it's a fake smile, it doesn't matter because if my face is in that position for 60 seconds, that tells my nerves that I'm, I'm doing good. I'm doing better. And so those endorphins get released. So I, mean, I want to get succinct and answer your question. We all have some kind of trauma in our life. We all have had some kind of loss because what is trauma? It's either one event or a series of ongoing events that puts us in danger. And every day, each one of us is in danger. Yes, if we step outside of our homes, look, we just read the statistics. It's not better, it's worse. And at this point, we all know someone who's had COVID. And many of us have lost family members to COVID. So we know this is real. Denial is the first part of Kubler-Ross's um, what does she call that? The grief cycle. If I can pretend it's not happening, I'm good. We can't, I can't pretend and stay healthy. I have to say, I choose, I don't have to do anything, but I choose to say, look, the more we early childhood folk know about the adverse childhood experiences study, the more empathy we can carry into each relationship with each child. And let's start out with empathy toward ourselves, right? When we have a loss, how many of us were taught, okay, you know, that's it, I'll send my condolences, but we move on. Scott, when has that not helped you to just move on? You know, because so many things were coming at once, so many losses and you moved on, but what's wrong with that? What's, What's wrong with that picture? And Holly, I, I think that's really the, the part that resonated with me and really, you know, you, you can have the, the, I like to call it that soul punch moment where where it just, there's just the moment of enlightenment, enlightenment. but with ACEs, with adverse childhood experiences, if you look at, um, if you look at the lifespan of somebody, the average person that's had one or more ACE, ACEs, um, the, the lifespan is reduced by 20 years. Um, if, if, if smoking was the culprit there, um, you could be for darn sure there would be prevention, there would be 
Um, there'd be government efforts, there would be um, policy, there'd be governance built around that. Um, another thing, we are, we are um, creatures that, that have survived throughout time on stress response. In these adverse childhood experiences, they create these long lasting stress responses. So they say that a child or a human, a person that has had one or more ACEs has four times the probability of having an autoimmune disease. And, and the thesis is that that trauma is, has these long tail stress responses, cortisol being out of control, hormones being out of whack, just being stressed the fuck out for, for extended periods of time. And that having such an adverse impact on the life that you live. Scott, I'm going to nail right into that one because, look, there are 10 points on that ACEs study. And I recommend if you haven't taken it, folk that are with us, just, just Google it. The ACES study, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, it was done in California and it was done on a significant number of people over time. And I interviewed one of the people who was one of the researchers. researchers. I interviewed Dr. John Medina shortly after the study came out and I said to him, John, what can you tell us if there's one thing you want us early childhood folk to know that we can embody and do with the children that would help them with their trauma? I, I, you know what? I, I listened to him and he didn't hesitate for a heartbeat. But Scott, what would you say? What would be the one thing you feel like you could offer children who are going through trauma? So, so I think so going back to my psychology background, so, mm -hmm. so uh, it's comfort, right? So, so a place of refuge, um, giving that child an opportunity to, um, to talk about it, um, express, uh, you know, the, the reaction that they're having. Um, so good old fashioned uh, talk therapy and, and mindfulness um, and really just, just trying to give them some, you know, the thing about childhood trauma is it's so hard to to for that child to work through and rationalize and and understand the cascading de de dependencies. So um, more than anything, just help, just help and trying to understand it. OK, you know, I want to say so many things, but I'm just going to bing, bing, bing. First off, Dr. John Medina said. The second thing that you said, you talked about refuge. He said, Holly Elisa, the most important thing we need to give these children is safety. My response was, as an early childhood professional, was love. If they feel loved, absolutely unconditionally loved for who they are, they're going to feel that everything else will follow. But he reminded me that until a child feels safe, the child can't feel anything else. I mean, there's there are neuroscientists today, uh, Matthew Lieberman, for example, who's flipping upside down Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We thought, you know, you got to have food first, you got to have a shelter over your head. No, no, no. We need to belong to a tribe. We need to feel like we belong to a group where we have a base. And if we don't have that, we're not going to get the food. We're not going to get the roof over our heads. So I I'm, I'm want to say the thing that's very serious about ACEs and little children is we don't have studies yet enough on what happens within the brains of little children that are survivors. Only Dr. Judith Herman, who wrote years ago, 1992, I think, Trauma and Recovery said, and I quote her in my book, she said, look, the brains of children who are subjected to trauma develop very rapidly in certain ways and they don't develop rapidly in other ways. And I remember as a small child, I have significant clear memories of having been a very small child. And the, the, neuro, the scientists will say, you wrong. You didn't have that, that's not true. However, I think Herman's right. I think that little children who are subjected to trauma grow up really quickly grow up with nerve cells grow up too. So here's the one study I can quote you, which is traumatized children have, and the word was exquisite, exquisitely developed sense of how to read nonverbal behavior. 
Yeah. Uh, you can see what that would be, right? I mean, if my father was an engineer from an Ivy League school, he was also the son of, of immigrants, firstborn son, and um, had many fine traits, but he had a flashpoint trigger anger that would turn him into violence. And I, as a small child, needed to know, was I safe? And so as soon as I could, one year old, yes, as soon as I could walk before one, 18 months, I was learning how to survive. And I had to figure out, figure that out. So what, what Herman said is these little kids are developing rapid ways of, of seeing things. And I think a lot of the child, early childhood studies we have, Scott, and you were a psych major. I was a literature major. But look, I think those studies got, I need to get revised based upon all the children that are traumatized. And the other thing I need to say is, there, when you, when, my friends, when you're taking this um, test, it, it, just answer it honestly. There are no right or wrong answers. There are 10 questions. I got 8 out of 10. I scored eight out of 10 now. And the only reason one of them, one of them is was someone was your family divorced. And my family was, you know, had Catholic background and religious background that said, you don't get divorced. So there was that. And also I'm, I, I'm mostly white. I'm also part black, but I'm most, I look white. I passed. And so what happened was the chances of my felon relatives getting put in jail was smaller because they were white they looked white okay i would have probably had all 10 because i had felon relatives um but we look good here's the thing scott i want to say this dr john bradshaw said we've got to watch out for the perfect children the children that are trying to please us not just the children that are screaming for help by being runners or being biters or by being you know violent kids no Bradshaw said, watch out for the placating kids. Watch out for the kids that are perfectionists. Watch out for the kids that say, Mr. Scott, can I help you today? Now, maybe that's a very happy child, but it might be if that child is every day saying, can I help you, Mr. Scott? And the child has no sense of look, of knowing what her own needs are because she's been taking care of adults. you got to work with that child, too. So what I want to say to you guys is look at me. As I said, yeah, I got the white hair, but I also got the purple hair. I'm going to be, I'm going to be 75. <laughs> New Year's Eve, the world celebrates, okay? And guess what? My older sister, Lynn, who's a, who's a psychiatrist, when she turned, um, she turned 78, and I said, Lynn, it's interesting. I didn't think about it. My question to her, Scott, was, Lynn, did you expect to be alive at 78? She immediately said, No. Because children know in our bodies, we, we take in so much stress from hypervigilance. We take in so much stress from protecting ourselves. We've taken so much stress for being the parentified child. We became the adults in our families. And you see that in your programs. You have little kids coming in acting like Einstein. And maybe they are Einstein, but they're also possibly not having childhoods at home. So my family, as I wrote in my book, my two sisters and I, what, two PhDs, two Juris Doctorates, one MD degree. I mean, we were always looking like the perfect family because traumatized families don't want people to know that they've got trauma because we all need to look like we're just fine. And in America, many of us were taught, especially early childhood, we were taught to look like We've got it all together. I tell you, and I wrote about this, I was giving a keynote address in Boston to a AEYC organization there. And, and I was talking about the statistics on, um, on trauma. This was years ago, like the, probably 1995. And in, on, there I was up on the stage and there was a large group and the audience in part was Vietnamese. So my, Words are being translated into Vietnamese, and all of a sudden I went pre-verbal. This can happen to people who have been traumatized. We get, we get knocked into a moment that so reminds us of our past that we go pre-verbal. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk says, and he wrote The Body Keeps the Score, which is one of the most powerful books. He said, look, when trauma returns to us, thought, it doesn't return necessarily as a memory. It returns as a feeling that can overwhelm us. So there I am on stage in Boston, Massachusetts, giving this very professional keynote and to Vietnamese visitors, OMG. 
and I choked. I couldn't breathe. I, it was like a panic attack. And I wanted to run off the stage because one of the first responses to trauma is to run for the hills, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, right? And so I wanted to run away. And I said, Holly Elisa, sweetheart, just put your feet on the ground, feel your feet connecting to the ground and ask for help. And in that moment, I almost started to cry, but what I said to folk, truly a geyser coming up from the heart. Scott, I said, I'm right now having one of those flashbacks and I want, I want to let you know that I'm safe and you're safe with me. I want you to know that I am the child in these statistics. And if it weren't, I am the child whose mother was mentally ill. I, and, and I took care of my mother. I am the child, now an adult, whose father looked great on the outside, but was violent and also incestuous. I am that child, and I want you to look at me today and see me as who I am, because I am also the person who has more joy than I can <laughs> sometimes bear. And I'm also the person that made a choice to be an early childhood, just like you did, because we know we can make a difference. And then, I, I won't tell you the whole story, but then I said, I invite you to remember, and Scott, I invite you to remember this too, who was that one person in your life when you were a child that totally got you, that saw you and said, Scotty, you are just the bee's knees and the cat's PJs, you know? And I didn't have anyone like that in my home because I had narcissists or troubled people. They couldn't connect. I survived by going outside and befriending all the animals and all my neighbors and all the woods. However, here's the truth. I had one teacher when I was an elementary school student, Michael Ganta. From the minute I saw him and he saw me, we got it. And that man changed my life changed my life simply by, and if there's one message I want folk to get, you don't have to be a psychologist. You don't have to be an attorney. You don't have to be a trauma expert. You just have to be somebody who deeply empathizes and cares, which you wouldn't be here if you didn't have that. A child just needs to feel that that adult loves her and wants the best for her and listens to her and sees her and that develops back to what John Medina said, Scott, that develops the this, this safety, the safety that that child needs to grow. And I, I only had Michael Ganta for two months because he got promoted to be a, a principal. And when he left, he said to me, Holly, Elisa, you're a very special little girl and someday you'll make a difference. And Scott, I had never heard anything positive like that in my life. I carry that in my heart, and I want you to know that at age 90, Michael, Dr. Michael Gante is still my mentor. I sought him out. After all these years, I sought him out. He's in um, court, painted post New York. <laughs> I said, you probably don't remember me, but you know, here's what I remember about you, and I want to thank you. And as I thank him, I'm thanking everybody, including you, Scott, everybody who's listening, Thank you for the simple act of paying attention to a child. Thank you for seeing the value in that child and thank you for seeing the promise in that child because when that child is hypervigilant and in a traumatic situation, she's not seeing anything but survival and nobody's seeing her. In fact, you'll find that many children in the classroom develop what I call the invisibility syndrome. How many times have you taken count in your classroom and you go, oh my God, Milagros is here? She's so quiet. Guess what? Milagros might be the child who learned to survive by becoming invisible. She right. sucks energies. Do you know what I'm talking about, Scott? Oh, absolutely. So tell me more. I've been saying a lot. This is because it's so close to home and it's so powerful. But what, what are you hearing that might be helpful? So, so yeah, it actually, so you've, you've talked about um, one of the, the great concepts as a business owner that, that I, that, that I reckoned with early, which was, it doesn't, you know, your, your work culture that you can create can be a lot of things. Um, but the one thing it has to be 
to get productivity out of everybody, to have well-being amongst um, uh, amongst all, to have a happy people. It's safe. You know, if, if, if an engineer feels safe um, with uh, expressing a crazy idea or somebody on your, your team, but that safety, it, my job as a founder and a CEO is to create that safety. And, and I can relate to an educator in a classroom. Their mission is to create that safety with with COVID, with children. Now that we're seven, eight months into this thing, what is the advice you can give to your educators in the classroom? How do we talk about this? How do we create that aura of safety when everything seems to be like this shitty exercise of 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 being OCD and washing your hands and having a mask and not seeing somebody smile? Where do we start? And and Scott, what a painful rupture, and I mean that, a bloody rupture when a child comes running in and wants to give me a big hug with the boogers coming out the nose. You know, I never cared about that before. I figured I can always wash off what the, hey, but they're coming in now. These are bodily fluids, you know, this is, or it's airborne. They sneeze all over me. This is tough. And I want to say, I'm just going to go deep on this one. Sanctuary. We have to find a sanctuary inside of ourselves. And I invite everybody who's listening. Yeah, you've had the bejesus scared out of you. I've had the bejesus scared out of me. First week of the lockdown, my last immigrant uncle in Rochester, New York, grew up in the Sicilian ghetto of Rochester, New York. He died. And at that point, people could still hop on planes. And I was thinking, of course, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Next morning I woke up, of course I didn't get on the plane, but what a trauma, me with Sicilian roots to not be able to go and hug and touch. And Aunt Conchetta was married to Uncle Arturo for 67 years. I couldn't hug on her, I still haven't seen her. What I'm saying here, Scott, is the most important thing is to go within myself, invite you to go within yourself, and each teacher in the classroom, each director of a program, go in yourself and find the place where you feel safe. And keep going back to that every day, because as you touch on that, you will, you used the word emanate, you used aura, you will emanate to the children around you, safety. You will also emanate, you're safe to be with me. And so sometimes it's not even the verbal stuff. Now, I was going to talk with you about developmentally appropriate practices. What works with an infant might not work so much with a four and a half year old, but that's not true in some ways. The most elemental thing, Scott, is when I pick up a baby and I rock that baby, that baby's going to pick up what my nerve cells are doing. When I am in a classroom of four-year-olds and everybody's jumping around because they're crazy because COVID's going, oh my God, they're, you know what? When I enter the classroom, do those children feel safe with me? So point one is to go inside myself. And even when I'm having, which I have often because <laughs> I just broke a wrist and I can't get my hair right, but who cares? Anyway, what I'm saying here is, when I'm having a bad hair day, I don't pretend I'm not having a bad hair day. I would say to the children, you know what? If I look sad today, I am sad because I just lost my uncle and I loved him a lot and I miss him. And you know what? You remember when remember when Scotty lost his dog and we all helped each other out? Do you guys remember when you chose your favorite book that helps you feel better? Well, sometime today, when you're ready, would you choose your favorite book that you want might want us to read together? Just something like that. Yeah. I'm telling the kids what's going on with me, so they're because they're picking it up anyway. They don't miss a beat. They know I'm sad. So if I just, what's the word? Integrate. If I'm honest with them and say, "Look, yeah, I'm in. I love you forever and always," and I'm sad because I lost my uncle, and Let's, you know, today, let's keep that in mind. How can we help each other? How can we help each other? Children will pick that up. I mean, they know when they, when the teacher walks in the classroom, they know if the teacher is, they know what's going on with the teacher, even through Zoom. 
Look, they know they pick it up. Fred Rogers said this great thing, Scott. You've probably heard it. I might even have it memorized now. But he said, look, in times when the world is topsy-turvy for children, it is not the ever-present smile that matters to the children. It's their knowing that love can embrace all the feelings, sadness, loneliness, anger, rage, crazy, craziness. It's knowing that they're loved to the world's end, no matter what's going on in their world. Knowing that I love you when you're running so fast, I can't catch up with you and I think you're headed toward going over the fence and I'm scared, real scared. I love you. I love you. I always love you. So that, when we go back to ACEs, we go back to Nadine, we go back to all of these people who are expert. Honestly, I think the bottom line invitation is use this time. Dickens nailed it, Scott. He said, it's the worst of times, it's the best of times. Every time I face something that scares me and upsets me, and I was really, I'm going to tell you the truth, guys, I went into deep anxiety during the election, deep anxiety. And instead of running away from it, instead of doing what Scott and I just talked about, denial, I made a choice. I could not have done this as a child. I didn't have the help or the tools, but now I know how to do it. I made a choice to not run from those feelings. I made a choice to let myself experience the anxiety, know that I had right here, people I could call out to help. I have a, a trauma therapist. I can call him. I have, you know, I've got a lot of supports, but what I did was I said, I'm going to face the abyss and face what happens if I wake up in the morning and this is what's going on. And I cried and I was really shaken. And guess what? I didn't run away from myself. It was like Robert Frost said, Scott, you know this, one of his poems says, the best way out is through. This pandemic, by going through it, experiencing it, and learning from it rather than going, I'm fine, everything's good, that makes all the difference. I came out the other side feeling no matter what happened, as an early childhood professional, as an, as an author, I can keep giving back. Scott, it's like what I really respect recently, what, what you did. Lockdown, we're going to just, we at Kangaroo Time are just going to give it away. We're going to help people. We're going to do these podcasts. I said the same thing. My livelihood depends upon my traveling the world and giving keynote addresses. I mean, no one's going to retire on royalties. <laughs> Trust me. So, so, so when it was a lockdown, hey, when the lockdown came, I, I woke up and I said, that's it. All of my keynotes got canceled. And I said, oh, and my, my uh, savings went down too because everything crashed. And I said, okay. And here's a choice I made, Scott. It's kind of like your choice, except I made it for my business. I said, I'm going to choose to believe. I'm going to choose to trust. I'm going to choose to believe that this work that I do matters enough that I'm going to be able to keep doing it. And I'm not going to be a bag lady on the street. And so I decided to announce that I was going to give away as much as I could. If you don't have the money to pay me, call me. I have given presentations to parents in high rises in India that can't go up and down the elevator because it's a COVID zone. They've got three generations in four rooms. How can they have a, a active play area for the kids that need that and a quiet retreat area for grandma that needs her silence? I mean, that I love talking about stuff like that. So what I came to, Scott, is that the worst of times is the best of times. And I just want to engage our, re, our listeners. My friends, given everything you have faced and seen in 2020 with a triplicate of pandemics, you know, the COVID, then the up, upheaval with the election, and then all of the racism and the sexism and the rampant discrimination that's coming about. How have you taken this dark time and turned it into a time of light for yourself? What's one way in which you have been able to give back 
And I want to say to you guys, if you have learned how to be intimate with your students on Zoom, brava. <laughs> brava. That's just, for those of us that are people, people, Scott, and we had to do technology. That's crazy. But we did it. Look at all the teachers that were able to do that. And the teachers who couldn't, I want to, I get, get tears in my eyes when I think about the teachers from Head Start, for example, would get in their vans, they'd physically distance in the van, and they'd drive to each family, and they'd park the van across the street from the kids. They'd walk across the street, they'd stand at a distance from the kids, and they'd all be like throwing kisses, and they'd be doing all, and, and then somebody would break out with, a tootie ta, a tootie ta, a tootie ta ta. <laughs> and the parents be looking like, what is this? Is a teacher of my child? And but the children are going, yeah, thumbs up, you know, hoo hoo. And there's nothing like the connection that an early childhood professional has with each family and each child. And that's what's getting us through this pandemic. I honestly believe that what's getting us through the pandemic, Scott, is connection. You get to, I'm so grateful, you get to see your beloved wife, who you love to the end of the world and back every day now. Does that not make a huge difference? Oh, it's, it's such a, it's such a, uh, an embarrassment of gratitude. You know, it's, it's, it's these great things. And um, yeah, Holly, as, as we kind of wrap up, you mentioned something um, that that I want to close with. Um, and, and I want to take it to the perspective of the children and the families that we all serve um, and, and how they are missing out. Oh, I, I've had this conversation a number of times over the pandemic, but but a year seemed like a century to 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 uh, to my to you to me when we were five years old, right? Um, so, so regardless of the resilience of the child, um, these times, those interactions, um, those moments of understanding, the nonverbal cues, those those beautiful moments of intimacy, where, where your brain's developing and you're learning that. Um, our children are missing that. Uh, and, and I wanna challenge each and every one of our educators to try to provide as many of those as they can be it on Zoom. And, and like you said, the, the, the beautiful gesture of getting in a car and visiting students, it's just, it's unbelievable. And I just don't think we can overvalue it right now. Agreed. Agreed. Scott, it is about connection. When when um, the first week of the lockdown, my friend, Dr. Deborah Renetta Sullivan in Seattle, Washington, said to me, Holly, Elisa, don't you dare. And we, we were really frank. We wrote a book called Learning from the Bumps in the Road with each other. And she said to me, don't you dare. Don't you dare call it social distancing. You know about social emotional. You know that. Don't call it social emotion, emo, uh, social distancing, honey. Call it physical distancing. Yeah. Be because, and what a huge distinction. And she said that's what the World Health Organization is calling it. She was so right. I am a feeling person like you are, and yet I have learned to look into the camera like I am right now and just say to folk, your intention matters more than anything else. Your intention to be with that child and love on that child, even if it's from thousands of miles away, somehow the child can feel that. Somehow when you bring a routine, like just a routine, like in the morning, just you sing the same song. I have a buddy up in Prince Edward Island. She teaches preschool. And every day they all sing the same song. And every day they all do the same things. And a little kid who's at home. And you know what, Scott? This is so horrible. The escalation of child abuse and neglect and of spousal abuse has just skyrocketed since the lockdown. Of course, it's a pressure cooker. And so what if in that, what, 20 minutes we've got with a toddler, 
the, the two minutes were actually like this. And, you know, just in those moments, if that child feels a connection, and guess what? The, the recent research I read said, Scott, singing together, mm. singing together is as important as laughing together because when we sing together, our nerve cells, even our heartbeat lines up with the same rhythm. So if we're singing together, it's like, I'm gonna, maybe I'll end with this. It's like the group of kids that um, had a, a child who was on the spectrum and he, he really had trouble calming himself and and yet it was a classroom where everybody was learning. Everybody wanted to help. And so we all knew that a song that his family used with him was, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. And so one child might pick up that Jason on the other side of the room was starting to get anxious. And that one child would start singing, you are my sunshine. And then the whole classroom, oh, 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 pick it up. And we're, and then, ah, you know, everybody's singing. And Jason's at home again. So all the ways in which we can take those babies home, babies can be 74 years old, but the inner child inside. How can right. we help everybody feel like you have a home with me? It's like Fred Rogers saying, I want to be your neighbor. And look at all the children whose lives he transformed. We all have that power. Just won't you be, won't you be my neighbor? Because we're right. going together. You're not alone. That's so well said. So beautiful. Well, Holly, um, I think in the end, uh, regardless of, of your political affiliations, regardless of, of um, you know, how you feel about the direction of the country, we all just need to calm down and break into song together and, and synchronize, synchronize our hearts and souls. Um, but Holly, much love. Thank you. This was great today. I can't wait to do it again. We will do this again before our time in July in Buffalo, New York at Bounce. Um, and guys, you can find Holly Alyssa on Facebook at Holly Alyssa Bruno. And you can find her book at um exchange press is that right yeah it's also now it's sold. it like i said it sold so quickly that it's now in an ebook form so you can get it on amazon and here's something else scott every monday afternoon at 3 p.m on active childhood uk i read aloud from my book and i also we also have a, a chat we go up back and forth about how to face today's drama especially if it re-triggers yesterday's sadness so every Monday afternoon, I'm on there with people, and it's a worldwide thing. You can talk with people from Nigeria and and and, and New Zealand and Canada and uh, Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> Thank you. I look forward to our next time together, and I will hope to see everybody in person, healthy, in Buffalo, right? In Buffalo, yes. Shuffle and, uh, off, guys. Thank you so much, hon. Thank you, everybody. I love you. Thanks a lot. We'll see you guys. Bye. Bye-bye.